Hi people! Editing long play videos is quite a chore and I have found it increasingly difficult to spend time editing hours and hours of gameplay videos, so I decided to make a more condensed one instead. Ambenar is one of the most popular total conversion mods for EU4, but the world is completely alien at first glance and you might have trouble deciding where to start. It's a D&D fantasy mod, so you have all the classic elves, dwarves, orcs and others, all with different flavors and themes. Even the human realms are very diverse. There are many great options, but my first pick were the Dwarves of the Serpent Spine Mountains, here in the middle of the map. Each fantasy race in this world is represented by specific racial, military and administration modifiers. Dwarf rulers are long-lived, they will die around the age of 200 years. Making the ruler a general will drastically shorten their lives, so just avoid making the rulers generals as a dwarven nation unless you want to see them dead. From an administration standpoint, dwarves receive bonuses and malices in theme with their race. This does not affect gameplay too much, but beware of the improved relations malice. This modifier can make coalitions a real problem if not careful while expanding outside the mountains. The stability cost modifier can also be quite punishing, especially in the early game. They also have a small rival flavor where fort maintenance on rival borders is cheaper and changing rivals is twice as expensive. Dwarves are stubborn and hold grudges. Their biology is also incompatible with any other race, so there is no option to create royal marriages with other races. If Dwarven administration is nothing to write home about, the Dwarven military is great. Dwarves don't really know what a boat is and they are generally bad at riding horses, but they receive damage mitigation for both shock and fire, extra artillery damage, bonus versus forts and siege ability. Sure, Dwarves are a bit slower than other armies and they are slightly more expensive, but very dangerous on short distances. The speed penalty is made insignificant mid to late game through the restoration of the Dwarven Railway line, which we will talk about later. There are two types of Dwarven nations, the Remnants and the Adventurers. Let's explore the options one by one. Lore-wise, orcs and goblins invaded the mountains at some point in the past and completely ruined the Dwarven kingdoms. The Remnants are Dwarven nations that survived in a sense, holed up in their keeps. Only five such nations exist, with Verkalgulan and Ovdal Kanzad being the only two that have unique mission trees at the beginning of the game. Well, at the time of this recording at least. For a first playthrough, I recommend Verkalgulan. They start with a gold province and have an outstanding economy. Ovdal Kanzad are the Smolensk of the Dwarven nation, specialized in extremely effective artillery, but have a more precarious start. Each remnant starts with the Stagnant Remnant modifier, which blocks them from using colonists until it's removed. Don't worry, it doesn't last for very long. The Remnant Awakening event will fire at the start of the game. This gives you three choices which have an effect after approximately 10 to 15 years. The Administrative choice gives a free capital hold level upgrade, the Diplomatic choice gives an extra colonist for 50 years, and the Military choice gives a 50 year buff to army maintenance, income, settler increase and morale. Once the reward event fires, the Stagnant Remnant modifier will be removed and you may start colonizing. If you're not sure what to choose, just pick the military option. The other options are very powerful, but if you can't afford to run and defend extra colonies or can't upgrade the capital hall to level 2 in less than 10 years, then their full potential is wasted. A final note on Verkalgulan, beware their National Mercenaries mission reward. Thematically, it's very very cool, but the full mercenary reliance will block your manpower at zero, so you will be virtually unable to hire regular troops and split armies to perform carpet sieges or deal with rebels efficiently. Adventurers are quite different than the remnants. They are thematically dwarves that return to the serpent spine to reclaim it from the monstrous invaders. The adventurers can ultimately restore any of the ancient kingdoms that were destroyed by the monstrous hordes. All the dwarf adventurers share a mission tree, which is a good guide on how to proceed. Each dwarven hold in the mountains was the capital of a dwarven nation, and most of them are uncolonized, empty or controlled by monsters. Capturing and restoring a respective hold and reaching administration level 7 will allow the dwarven adventure companies to transform into the nation specific to that hold. Some of the restored dwarven nations have interesting and unique mission trees, but many do not, so choosing which nation to reform to gets to be an interesting choice. For a first playthrough, don't worry too much and just reform to any whole nation that you happen upon until you get the feel of the game and get comfortable enough to attempt a specific one. Adventurers have unique mechanics and non-standard economics before they settle down. 
First, the Dwarf or Reclaimer buff gives them extreme bonuses to manpower, army morale, force limit and army maintenance. Recruit the available mercenary company as one of the first actions and work to building up the army to force limit. The monstrous nations in the mountains have massive force limits themselves and with your overwhelming technology and army quality advantage you can conquer them with only half the army size. But that army needs to be built up in the first place. The bonus lasts for 50 years and is automatically lost if declaring wars on countries outside of the Serpent Spine, so beware of that. The land they control is virtually useless from an economic standpoint and revenue will come from adventuring efficiency instead, which is an adaption of the Prussian militarization from vanilla EU4. Adventuring efficiency can be increased by spending military mana and it naturally increases over time if having high prestige and having very few provinces and little development. Low stability also decreases adventuring efficiency, so try to keep it above zero. Adventuring efficiency grants tax income from thin air and will be a primary source of ducats before settling down. A high adventuring efficiency coupled with a Dwarova Reclaimer buff will also cut army maintenance to almost zero. Try to keep a balance though and do not ignore military technology. Two more mechanics specific to adventurers are Migration and the Purge Warband Decision. Migration works by simply selecting a province adjacent to the capital and clicking the Migrate button on the province interface. This will move the capital to the new location and abandon the previous one, while granting 50 of each type of mana for each migration click. Migration is possible even after colonizing or conquering other provinces as long as you have the adventure company government and space to migrate to. You can migrate once every two years and that duration is fixed. No need to destroy your stability for faster migration, it will not work and it will hurt adventuring efficiency. Purging Warband is a decision that is only available if you control a single province and you conquer a single other province from a monstrous nation. If you have colonies, they must be abandoned in order to have the decision available and if you control more than two provinces in total, you will not have access to this decision anymore. What it does is completely depopulates the monstrous province and grants some bonus mana and prestige. This is intended to wipe out some undesirable cultures from the map. For example, say a goblin settled on a hold, you conquer that hold from the goblins, purge the warband and then migrate into it to take full advantage of the province without having to deal with uh, foreign culture and religion. The adventure government is nothing to write home about, you can only get rid of it by transforming to a dwarven hold nation. Also, no free reforms and no government progress will be kept when reforming, so you will have to start from scratch with a new government. One strategy while adventuring is to spend the reform progress to expand administration for extra government capacity, which will not be lost. If you need to choose a starting adventure company, any are just as good. If you want a more sheltered playthrough, I recommend the Blackbeard Cartel. They are quite far away from any dangers and have the Gorburad hold not too far to their south. This hold is located in a dead end part of the mountains, so any threat can only come from a single direction and it's extremely easy to develop and defend. The company of Duran Blue Shield is also a good choice for a first playthrough if you settle the hold to your north. Astra Expedition is another great choice for a more dynamic adventuring experience, but be prepared to fail spectacularly and don't be afraid to scorch your only province during a war. Ancestor worship is the one true dwarven religion at the start of the game at least. Some adventuring companies start with the regent court religion, but once they settle in a whole province, they get the choice to change to ancestor worship by event. Pay attention and choose to switch religions. Making the choice will convert all the regent court provinces automatically. The ancestor worship synergizes with everything that dwarves care about and there is no reason that I can think of to keep the regent court. The baseline modifiers are Fort Defense and Main Culture Advisor Cost Reduction. This religion does not have access to the Defender of the Faith mechanic, but employs the Vanilla Holy Site mechanic. There are seven Holy Sites. If one of them is occupied by an Ancestor Worship Nation and the province religion is Ancestor Worship, then an extra ability is unlocked. At the start of the game, only one bonus is unlocked, leaving six provinces to be conquered and converted for the full roster of religious bonuses. The Serpent Spine is a unique environment. There are three types of terrain specific to the mountains. Holds, caves and dwarven roads. Caves are very tough to develop, have high defensiveness, two dice penalty to attackers and have a random chance to generate with a Cavern of Interest modifier. Owning a cave with this modifier unlocks a decision to explore the Cavern of Interest. 
for a small cost, taking the decision will result in a negative or positive event with a chance of receiving a permanent province modifier or a permanent country modifier. Overall, exploring caverns of interest can yield great rewards and it's very worth racing other nations for control over such caves. Dwarven roads are not special at first. We have decent defensiveness and one dice roll penalty to attackers and start with the old ruined rail modifier, which does nothing. What is important is that at administrative tech level 16 and then at 21, you will unlock decisions to restore and then upgrade the Dwarven rail provinces. These increase friendly movement speed by 30 and 75% respectively and severely decrease province governing cost. And therefore, there is no reason to fully state core all the Dwarven Rail provinces if you can afford the admin mana. The state maintenance cost can be very steep, but if the state reaches prosperity, the goods produced modifier would greatly compensate for that. I remember seeing rocket rails occasionally, but I can't seem to find out how to get them with the dwarves. Either way, you will be zipping around from Kanor to Rahen in no time with the restored Dwarven Railway. Holds are a topic unto itself. A lot of land is uncolonized at the start of the game, but every nation gets the Dwarva Reclaimer buff, which grants a free colonist and penalizes native integration and uprising. This means that only viable colonization policy is native repression. The other choices can't prevent uprisings, and there is literally no native integration possible. All cave and road provinces have very powerful native populations, monsters that will rise up with a 10% chance a month in great numbers. This means that colonies must be either guarded or purged at all times. Purging natives is extremely expensive, so only do so when strictly necessary. But in general, you should be having some dedicated armies tasked with defending the colonies as they are being built. Exploring the caves with conquistadors is also very risky and perilous and a waste of manpower due to the high ferocity of these natives. One more mention is that the Serpent Spine Mountains are the only place in the world where the Mithril resource can be found. Mithril is a very valuable metal with a price of 8 ducats. Each Mithril resource would increase shock damage dealt by 2% and decrease shock damage received by 1% globally. This makes dwarves even more powerful because they are in the position to completely monopolize the Mithril market early and reach ridiculous levels of shock damage dealt and mitigated while making tons of money off of it. Holds are the supreme type of province in this mod. They can generate immense amounts of wealth and manpower, but must be carefully managed and well protected. Also, they complete the dwarven team of digging for riches with disastrous consequences at times. By default, holds have excellent defensiveness and a two dice roll penalty to attackers. They have a huge supply limit, a small development cost decrease bonus and are all centers of trade which can be and should be upgraded to tier 3 if possible. Holds also gain passive development over time, but very very slowly. This passive development increase can be accelerated by completing a unique dwarven project in the mountains south of Huljorkad, the Firan Yalen Dam. This is an expensive project that can be constructed in the northernmost state of Harpilen and is a fun money sink with a neat reward. The holds have two main modifiers. One is the owned by a subterranean race. This requires that the culture majority in the province is dwarven, goblin or kobold and that culture is not oppressed. In our case, it should be 100% dwarven. Otherwise, tax and production revenue in the holds are reduced by half. Non-subterranean races do not know how to run a hold efficiently with the notable exception of Marhold humans in one single province, but that's another story. The other main modifier is the dig level. The dig levels range from 1 to 10, with only two holes being able to be dug down to level 11. One is the capital of Aldir in Western Serpent Spine, initially owned by the Shattered Crown Orcs, and the other is Gronstunad in Eastern Serpent Spine, initially owned by the Command. The higher the dig level, the higher the tax returns, the goods produced bonus and the defensiveness of the province. Each level grants increased massive local development cost reduction. Digging Deeper has a development requirement, with digging to level 2 requiring 40 development, then 50 for level 3, etc. If a hold is not damaged or ruined, the dig level can be increased. Initially, only the capital province can be actively or manually dug via decisions. All non-capital holds will dig passively if the requirements are met. Later in the game, there is an expensive decision which allows you to actively dig the non-capital holds as well. It's expensive but it's worth it, as passive digging is extremely slow and obscure. 
During capital digging, a series of events will fire from time to time that can help or hinder the digging progress and can put extra stress on your economy and military. Keep an army close to the capital while digging, just in case, trust me. Also, if given the option, try to avoid using explosives, as that can have disastrous consequences. There are some negative modifiers that holds me half. These are infested, ruined or damaged hold. Each of these modifiers make the hold virtually useless. Ruined or infested holds modifiers are found on newly colonized ones. Infested is the worst one of all. This one will remove any type of revenue from the province and hurt the local state overall, while occasionally spawning barbarian orc divisions. Spawning may happen even in a province that's under colonization. Once the province is fully colonized, the infestation can be removed by decision. Choosing the decision will immediately spawn 18 orc divisions, which are quite strong, so prepare a solid army on the province to meet the threat directly. Ruined holds are a bit milder, but will also reduce local production to zero. Ruined holds can be restored via decision, and they cost a serious amount of cash, administrative, diplomatic and military mana, scaling with the development of the hold being restored. The holds can also be damaged if sieged down in a war or by rebels. A hold that is captured will suffer development damage and receive the damaged hold debuff which can be removed just like the ruined hold one. This is very expensive and should be avoided at all costs. Therefore, do not leave any holds undefended or without a, at least a basic fort building. You don't want them to be captured by random rebels that run around the country or by enemy armies. Defending holds is priority number one in any circumstance. After a province reaches dig level 4, an event will fire where you may choose a hold infrastructure that specializes a hold in a sense from a number of choices dictated by the resource produced there. The basic infrastructure comes for free via event. If a capital hold with an infrastructure reaches 90 development, you may choose to upgrade the local infrastructure via decision. This will cost a lot of cash and mana, and after approximately 30 years, the infrastructure will be upgraded to an advanced version, which increases bonuses. Between selecting to upgrade the infrastructure in completion, the province will suffer a development cost penalty, so you might want to develop by non-direct means while the infrastructure is being built. On top of all this, if a hold has the honor of being the first that upgrades a certain type of infrastructure, a wonder specific to that infrastructure is automatically built in the province. Upgrading infrastructure can only be done in the capital, so more than one advanced infrastructure can only be obtained via conquest or via moving capitals to other holds. The wonders grant some great global modifiers and are worth pursuing. My personal favorites are the foundry and the metropolis ones. Even though resources in newly colonized holds are generated at random, there are a few holds that have a guaranteed resource. The ones that I'm aware of are Mithratum, which guarantees Mithril, and Verkalgulan, which guarantees gold. Even if the resources are changed via event, the guaranteed resource will be returned via another event to the destined one. Holds which produce gold are susceptible to depletion just like any other province, therefore they receive an additional modifier which increases production by 2 points for each development click to compensate for the depletion events. The unique experience of playing a dwarf in the mountains is completed by a total of 4 disasters specific to this environment. Seems like a lot, but dwarfs can get so rich and powerful that it's almost necessary to have something like this to keep them in check. The main disaster, disaster number 1 which is guaranteed to fire sooner or later, is the Horde Curse. Listen carefully, this disaster needs to be anticipated and managed or it will potentially cause a chain of bankruptcies that will severely slow down or even completely ruin a playthrough. There are two conditions that initiate the disaster. One is having a base income of 150 ducats a month or more, the other is having 10,000 ducats in the bank. The disaster itself will almost completely destroy all of your sources of income while it's active. It will increase global unrest by 8, stability cost and advisor maintenance, while massively increasing monthly corruption and inflation. It's very very bad. If the ruler has the greedy trait, it makes it even worse. Simply avoid having greedy rulers, kill them, abdicate them, load games, do whatever it takes not to have a greedy ruler. It simply makes the disaster worse for no reason. Winning the disaster requires taking 5 reform decisions, each of them mitigates some of the bad effects. When selecting a reform, there will be multiple events that will massively drain your coffers. It cannot be understated how much money you will end up having to spend to get rid of the Horde Curse. 
getting loans will only spiral your economy out of control, so try to avoid getting loans as much as possible. Also, don't be afraid to declare wars to only get money and don't forget to trade favors for cash from your richer allies, offer condottieri to other nations, sell crown lands if you have to, just avoid loans. Before anything else, try to fire this disaster as soon as you can. Ideally, you should aim to gather 10,000 ducats when you have around 600 development and or an income of about 60-70 ducats a month. The money that you have to pay during the disaster scale with your income, so the lower the initial income, the smaller the payments that you have to do. Keep hoarding cash while the disaster is ticking up. This should give you a bit of extra money to manage this disaster. Remember, it's called the hoard curse, not the income curse. Hoard as much money as you can. Spend the money wisely until the disaster fires and try to build buildings exclusively in your holds for maximum efficiency. A good idea is to go for the economic idea group as your first or second one. Not only that it synergizes with everything that dwarves care about, but the inflation reduction and interest per annum help mitigate the disaster somewhat and allows you to even take a couple of loans. If advisors are too expensive, don't be shy to fire them and hire lower level ones. Mothball your unnecessary forts and avoid paying for mercenaries if you don't have to. You can choose to do the five reforms in any order, but you should start with the corruption reform and end with a baron reform. The reason is that the corruption reform pays for itself in a sense. When completing it, you will receive a 15% decrease in corruption, so you can debase currency up to 15% and recover a lot of money doing so at the end of this reform. The Baron's reform comes with a mana cost that is mitigated by completing other reforms, so it should be left for last. The Bank reform can be selected second or second to last, it's a good idea to take it second to last as it has some events that let you choose between paying money or stability. If this reform is taken second to last, choose to get the stability hits instead of paying money. The reason is that completing the disaster will reward 3 points of stability, so you can get it up to maximum for free in a sense, while sparing your treasury. Once the reforms are passed, the disaster ends and you receive a temporary buff. You are now free to spend what's left of your money on whatever you want. Disaster number 2 in our list is the Goblin Tide. You might have the luck to discover an old hold deep underground while digging in your capital province. This is discovered via event and will add a permanent modifier to the province which grants development cost and goods produced. Great stuff! If you discover this while having an old ruler, he gives you the option to bury the old hold, mentioning that it's not a good idea to open it up. Open it up anyway, who cares what all geezers have to say? But really, the bonuses are very good and they are permanent. The consequences of having the old hold buff is that you may unleash the goblin tide later in the game. It kind of fires randomly, but when it does, tons of goblin barbarians will pour out of your capital, huge stacks will spawn and they will have to be defeated. Thankfully, they are goblins, so they are many, but relatively weak. The stacks are also ruled by generals, so they are not simply stack wiped after a defeat and need to be chased around a bit. There are several events that take place during this disaster, and they come in three stages essentially. The first stage will simply spawn barbarian stacks in your capital from time to time. The second stage is the most dangerous one. It will create five portals represented by permanent modifiers in five random provinces that you own. These portals will spawn goblin stacks on creation and they have a high chance of spawning more stacks every month. These can run out of control if not addressed immediately. They can be closed by capturing the provinces from the goblins with an army and then selecting a decision to close the goblin gate. Selecting the decision will spawn, you guessed it, even more goblins. Ideally you should have 5 armies ready to deal with them quickly and maybe a 6th army to clean up the defeated goblin hordes and whatever stacks spawn additionally in the capital in the meantime. Stage number 3 will spawn a larger than normal stack of goblins in the capital commanded by a very strong general. Once the final stack is destroyed, all 5 portals are closed and there are no rebels in your territories, the disaster finishes and you receive a temporary buff for defeating the goblin tide. Your manpower pool will thank you once this disaster is over. Disaster number 3 is one of the more mm, controversial in the Serpent's Mine. The Serpent's Rot disaster actually has something to do with the cavern of interest mechanic. It has an interesting arc and lore which I'll try not to spoil. Mechanically speaking, it's quite terrible, and it's only one of the few methods that the game employs to punish the dwarves for being so rich all the time. What happens roughly is that in the mid-game a plague appears and ravages the serpent's spine. It starts in a certain cave, 
and spreads from province to province at an alarming rate. The plague essentially destroys the production in the province's effects, so it needs to be contained as soon as possible. You need to select decisions to launch expensive research into the nature and the cause of this plague, and it's all quite random. I'm not privy to all the details, I usually throw just as much money as I can into researching a cure. At some point you may decide via event to contain the plague with fire. This means that you may send armies to burn the affected provinces to slow down the spread of this plague. You should do your best to keep it from spreading in too many of your whole provinces as that can ruin your economy. If another nation discovers the cure before you, you may choose a decision to collaborate with them and get the cure for yourself as well. Once a cure is researched, you get an event to spread the cure through the ventilation system and end the plague. Again, lore-wise, it's very interesting, but it feels like a kick in the groin from a mechanical standpoint. Disaster number four is related to digging again. While digging in the capital, you will randomly discover layers of different materials that are difficult to dig through. When you discover a layer, you may choose to spend a very large amount of money to permanently increase your digging speed or not to pay the cost at all for a permanent decrease in digging speed. It's usually good to pay the money as digging later in the game can take very, very long time and every boost helps reaching the bottom faster. One of the layers is special, the strange calcite layer. Breaking through this layer will trigger the Obsidian Invasion disaster tick. While this disaster ticks, you may get some rumor modifiers in random provinces. Exploring the rumors will make the disaster fire faster. Okay, what happens is, dwarves from another dimension spring into existence. These are the Obsidian Legion. They will immediately take over a percentage of your lands and automatically declare war. The Obsidian Legion has a unique government, a unique Dwarven religion, they can reform into an exclusive tag of their own and spawn a unique world project, but have no unique missions yet. They will also receive serious military buffs while you will suffer military debuffs for the duration of the first war. The only saving grace is that their army started low morale and are spread out a bit, so they can be wiped out and should be wiped out as soon as possible before they have a chance to regroup. Alternatively, you may choose to play as the Obsidian Legion for a totally different experience, as the Obsidian Legion is an interesting country unto itself. You will retain most cores, so you can take them back in multiple wars, but getting a 100% war score against the Obsidian Legion will simply return all your initial lands back and end the disaster. The terrible thing is that these four disasters may trigger in parallel if you're unlucky. Another reason to handle the horde cores as early as possible. You don't want to have to fight hordes of goblins while bankrupt, or you don't want to pay for the reforms while the serpent's rot spreads into the tunnels. In conclusion, playing the dwarves will be a guaranteed blast and full of interesting events and decisions. You will mostly be concerned about the happenings inside of the mountains and care little about the outside world, which for a first playthrough is absolutely fine. The world is huge and taking it all in can be intimidating. First long-term goal can be reforging the Al Dwarov Empire by conquering 25 of the holes that are present inside of the Serpent Spine. Al Dwarov comes with their own idea set, which contain 10% siege ability and 10% extra governing capacity, among other things, and with the possibility to form the Alm Haraz, which is a sort of Dwarven HRE. The command to the east makes for a great final boss to your Dwarven campaigns. It's a very strong nation with a huge force limit. They have to be faced in order to liberate the last 4-5 holds in the Eastern Serpent Spine. Enjoy avenging the Jade Dwarves and teaching the command the meaning of PAIN! And uh, yeah, don't forget to have fun. I'm intending to do some very um, specific guides in the future for different uh, countries. To sort of highlight some of the more interesting ones that I've managed to play with. Um, I hope that's gonna be, you know, if it's gonna be, if it's something interesting or if you are curious about an opinion about a specific country, just let me know and I'll try to do something whenever I have the available time. So thank you very much and uh, yeah, take care, bye.